Listen, let's get, go directly to the word of the Lord today. There is a word from the Lord. And so I want to call your attention to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Joel called by some theologians, theologians, the John the Baptist of the Old Testament. The book of Joel. And we're going to call your attention to Joel chapter number two and we're going to read in your hearing verse 21 through 27 and see what the lord has to say to us today there is a word from the lord there is a word from the lord the god of the bible my friends i'm not going to sleep he hasn't he's not off the job he's not silent amen he's not uh, um bewildered he's not caught off god in fact god is in charge and even, even as we pray against the coronavirus and all of that, we want to add to that prayer, now, Lord, thy will be done. Because, you know, God knows how to get people's attention. God knows how to call people to bring a nation to its knees. The God of the Bible is, is in charge, and he's in charge of this. The Lord saw this coming. Nothing catches God off guard. And uh, so I'm grateful today by my comfort and my peace uh, is in him. All right. If you have it, you know, we love here at the upper room hearing the sound of, of Bibles, the pages turning. And while I was talking to you, I heard a few pages behind me turning. And, uh, and I miss all those wonderful Bible people who come to the church and bring their Bibles. Uh, but they're home. They're turn I can imagine hearing you whip out your Bible and, and turn to the book of Joel. It says this in chapter number 2, verse 21 through 27. Look at this word from the Lord. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause the cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the latter rain in the first month. For the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. Look, look, listen to this. God says, my great army, which I sent among you, I will restore what they have eaten. And it shall... And you shall eat plenty and shall be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. For none else, and, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. After Thursday night's Bible study, and the Lord blessed us real good.
this past Thursday night yes, we did. was our first Thursday night under the new orders. And we taught the word of the Lord. And when I went home and I uh, retired for the evening, I asked God, I said, Lord, what do I preach next? What do you want me to say? What is the word for your people? Because the thing that I know is, I know that God is always speaking. And um, I want to say to the ministers out there, to the prophets, to the bishops, to the teachers, and to those who have callings and, and, uh, and titles, and some of our titles and positions are quite lofty. In times like these, this is not the time that those of us who walk in the uh, higher, if you will, callings in the kingdom to be silent. There are certain times when you cannot afford to come up small. Anybody can be a preacher, a teacher, a prophet, uh, a seer, uh, a singer, or whatever, when times are normal, when people can come, and when the, when the crowds are already there, and you have flown in with a, a nice first-class ticket and given royal accommodations. It really doesn't take an anointing uh, to function in an environment like that. But in times like these, uh, this is the time when it is, an, it, is, it is absolutely necessary to hear a word from the Lord. And this is a time where the, the, the preacher, God's voice, must step up and uh, lead in prayer, give people a word from the Lord, uh, be ready. The, the leadership of the church cannot be bewildered in a time like this. No pastor can, uh, can afford to, to remain stunned for any period of time because the people look to the preacher for a word from the Lord. I prayed and I heard the God, the God of the Bible. I heard him say to me literally, he said this, I heard this in my ear. He said, I will restore. I will restore. Verse 25 says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. And look at this, my great army, which I sent amongst you. I want to preach today from this subject, I will restore. This is the message that the God of the Bible has given me to give to you from God's truth, the word of the Lord. I will restore. Bless us, Lord, now as we minister the word of the Lord. God, may we say that which you would have us to say and go no further. And Father, we pray that hearts will be strengthened. We pray that we do no damage to the doctrine or to your word, but that we preach that which becometh sound doctrine in Jesus' name. Amen. I will restore. I will, uh, com I will make you complete. The word restore, complete, to be safe and to be, look at this, uninjured uh, in mind or body. God knows how to make us whole again. Let me say this by the way of introduction. For a great many of us, the closest thing that we have seen to this uh, in our lifetime was the attack on 9-11. Um, or, or should I say the response to the attack. As of now, there are roughly 120,000 cases of uh, the coronavirus in our country and 2,000 deaths in the U.S. Uh, and uh, and, and we're, the response to it is amazing. I have to say, though, that uh, the 2,000 deaths that have taken place as a result of this coronavirus, uh, that's 2,000 too many. And the people have suffered real losses and hearts are truly broken and uh, people are hurting. But the 2,000 deaths that have taken place thus far 
uh, since uh, January in our country due to this coronavirus represents a bad day in the abortion industry in this country. And uh, nothing gets shut down. It doesn't make the news. No one seems to be, or very few people, seem to be con concerned. And these are innocent lives that have never uh, killed anybody, have never broken the law. In fact, they never got a chance to see the light of day. And in this country, over 2,000 babies are aborted each day. And even in my state, the state of North Carolina, some of you are streaming uh, from other areas. Do you not know that whereas today, across this great state, in many of the counties, churches cannot, uh, uh, people cannot gather for church service as we normally do, but the abortion clinics are still open. And uh, there's something wrong with that. You see, while we are praying about the virus, we may be concentrating on the wrong thing. Uh, there's something wrong with that. And by the way, uh, they did not see fit to put on the non-essential list ABC stores. Well, I guess there's some wisdom to that. If, you ain't gonna let, if you're not going to let people seek the Lord, I guess then the only thing that's left for them to do is to get drunk. But it's amazing how uh, the ABC stores are open. The abortion clinics are open. And, uh, and I'm going to show you in the text one of the things that caused the problem in Joel's day was drunkenness. You see, I'm, I'm wondering if we get it, if we truly understand the God that we serve. When judgment and when things take place, that, that uh, when God begins to move and begin to uh, bring judgment, we're quick to pray against the judgment. But what we need to be quick to do is to repent. And ask the Lord to forgive us. Amen. I'm not, I'm not volunteering for any condition, for any disease, for any sickness. I pray that the, the coronavirus is done away with. But the truth is, it, it is of the Lord's mercy. When you consider the wickedness of the times in which we live, it is of the Lord's mercy that there is not a coronavirus every other day. So I think that we need to make sure we are approaching, we are approaching this thing uh, properly. Yes, so we haven't seen, for most of us, we haven't seen anything like this since 9-11. Um, and, and the difference is, uh, due to the response, you know, if you would turn the television off, you, you didn't see what was going on in New York and in Washington, D.C., and uh, in the uh, Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area where the plane was shot down. All over the country, we see and feel the effects of the shutdowns. Um, 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits just last month, unprecedented in the history of this country. Um, the Dow Jones due to the coronavirus on March the 5th, um, fell 996 points. Compare that to um, Black Monday back in 87, October the 19th, when the stock market fell. And to this day, they haven't figured out what really caused it. Black Monday, the, the market fell, and uh, it fell and dropped 508 points on Black Monday. And yet, with this coronavirus, it has dropped 996 points or more. It fluctuates, and the Lord willing, it will come back. But the point is, the impact that we've seen, we've never seen anything like this before. After seeking God, I said, Lord, what, what do we say? I haven't asked God what's going on as much as, God, what do you have to say about this? And so, I want us to look at the word of the Lord and look at, uh, at the book of Joel and let's look at its contextual setting for just a few moments. Now let me say that this very little is known about this prophet. The book of Joel is the smallest uh, book in the Old Testament. Very little is known about this prophet and uh, all that is told of us concerning his genealogy is his name, 
and his dad's name and, and the father's name in the Eastern times were almost like last names are to us today. The Bible says in chapter 1 of the book of Joel, says the word of the Lord that came to Joel. It's God's word. It's God's word. It's God's word. You know, many, many preachers today, I guess the new catchphrase is when we're preaching and teaching is we tell people what we need for them to understand. And I guess it, you, we sound deep when we tell them, I need for you to understand this. I, I need for you to know that. I need for you to do. But, you know, I'm not here uh, for what I need for you to understand. I want you to know what God wants you to know. I represent the Lord. It's the Lord's message and the Lord's word and not mine. Whether you ever understand me or not, you've got to understand God. And you've got to know that it's most important for us to understand what the Lord is saying. And those of us, when we preach, we cannot represent ourselves. We cannot just say it's what we need for the people to know. It's what God wants people to know. It's the word of the Lord. Notice how, see, even these harmless, benign things that are, that, that are slipping even into our lexicon, it is not good. The, the preacher has to make sure in his attempt to sound modern that he doesn't move away from the Lord. We are his representatives. I do not represent Patrick Wooden. I represent the God of the Bible. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel and uh, his father Pethuel um, the, the meaning of that uh, name is uh, uh, in, to engrave to carve and it's also um, uh, persuaded of God the name Joel means Jehovah is God so, so Joel is representing God here and the, and the theme by the way my friends of the book of Joel is that the Lord is the Lord of life. Social life, economical life, spiritual life, that he's the God who controls all of life. And, uh, and all we have to do is serve him. And, and he, he will control our economy. He will take care of our money. He will take care of our house payments, car payments. He knows all what he knows what to do when your light bill is due when you, and the gas bill too. We serve a God who is concerned about all of these things and even our spiritual lives and our natural life. So the theme of this book is that Jehovah is the Lord of life. Joel means Jehovah is God. And uh, one re one writer said that the reason Joel did not give anything else, didn't tell us anything else about his origin, is that this was Joel's way of saying the message is about God and not about me. So we know very little about this mighty man of God. In fact, there is discussion as to when uh, Joel ministered. Was it pre uh, exotic, exotic, or was it post exotic when the exiles were set free? Was it before then? Was it after then? Some uh, say that it was during the reign of King Joash. Others say that it was during the reign of King Uzziah. Let's look at uh, these kings for just a moment. If it was done, uh, he preached during the reign of King uh, Uzziah in uh, Second Chronicles. Uh, chapter 26. I want to show you something, and, uh, and, and God's going to bless us real good. Well, let's go with King Joash first in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Joash, some argue that uh, Joash was the king when uh, Joel uh, preached because Joel mentions the priests. Joel mentions the leaders, but throughout his book, he never mentions the king, and it, and it could quite possibly be because when Joash became king, Joash was only seven years old. And he was under the tutelage of, uh, uh, of a priest. Uh, Jehoiada was the priest who was under, uh, uh, he was the man who kind of directed uh, King Joash. And uh, Jehoiada was a good priest. He was a man of God who rightly 
guided the young king. But you know what happened, my friends? According to verse 15, the Bible says, But uh, Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they, and they honored him when he died. It says, And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done, look at this, good in Israel both toward God and toward his house. Now listen, let me just park right here for a moment. For those of you who kind of feel like, well, this is not so bad. God hasn't called us to just a, a location. It's not all about gathering in church. That sounds benign, but my friends, that misses the point. The gathering together is the primary mission of the church. That's primary. Uh, you can't have communion, you can't have feet washing, you can't have water baptism. We can't have the kind of services that God would have us to have unless we have the privilege of gathering together. Even what we're doing right now, this is not a substitute for our gathering together. I'm preaching to you right now. I'm teaching you the word of the Lord. I pray that you are listening intently, but intently. But listen, this does not take the place of our gathering together. I'm frankly uh, amazed at the number of saints who are not bothered by our gathering, our not being able to gather together. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalms 15 gives us the qualifications for even entering into God's holy hill. Psalms 91 calls the house of God the hiding place. A man in the Bible received the miracle from God because they said to Jesus, he loved our nation and built us a synagogue. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, it is the will of God for the people of God to gather together. This, major, this mighty man of God, this, this priest, Jehoiada, received an honor of great distinction. He was buried amongst the kings because he was good to the nation and he was good to the house of God. Well, look at this. After the death of Jehoiada came the priests, the princes of Judah, and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. Look at this. And they left the house of the Lord God, of their fathers and served groves and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespasses. They left God's house. They, they determined like many are saying today, worshiping in the house of the Lord is not that important. God can bless us regards to how we gather. Well, these people got in trouble because they left God's house. They began to worship and serve groves and idols. They began to serve false gods that were on the mountaintops. They began to, uh, they walked away from the Lord. And look at verse 19. It says, and yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. And they testified against them but they would not give ear. God sent prophets to tell the people, you need to go back to the house of God. But the people would not listen. The spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Now this was the priest who was good to Joash, raised Joash, tutored Joash, and now his son uh, is, is preaching and look at this, look at this, verse 20 says, And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of uh, uh, Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, the Lord hath forsaken you. And you know what they did to his son? They conspired against him 
and they killed him. Joash forgot all that Zacharias uh, father had did for him they conspired against him and they killed him some uh, theologians believe that this was the environment that Joel Joel's ministry came uh, to prominence in if it was under the reign of uh, King Uzziah if you look at uh, second chronicles chapter 26 it says then all the people of Judah took Uzziah who was 16 years old, and made him king. So now he was the king, and under Uzziah's reign, that was unprecedented prosperity and growth. As a matter of fact, the economy was so good under King Uzziah that it was a only, only King Solomon had a better economy during his reign. So everybody was blessed under Uzziah. And everybody was making money. It was just as America was or seemed to be just three or four weeks ago. The, the stock market, the Dow Jones was about to walk into the $30,000 uh, 30,000 point range. And, and, and records after records have been broken, but it came all crashing down. So that was all this growth under Uzziah, and Uzziah was a mighty man of God. And the Bible teaches in verse 5 that as long as he sought the Lord, that the Lord made him to prosper. Verse 16 says, but when he was strong, look at this, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord God and went into the temple to burn incense upon the altar of the Lord. And, 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 and uh, Azariah, the priest, and others told Uzziah, said, it does not appertain to you. You're not a priest. You are a great king. You are a great leader. But you're not a priest. You can't come into God's house and offer incense on the altar. He wouldn't listen. And then leprosy leaped from the altar and grabbed hold of him. Some believe that this was the, the, during the time when the prophet Joel came to his ministry. But, but notice this. When Joel began to preach in chapter 1, we've got a little preach teach here, and we're gonna, God's going to bless. In chapter 1, it says, the first thing he does is, he says in verse 2, Hear this, ye old men. See, he speaks to two or three groups of people. He says to the old men, hey, the, the, the fathers, the leaders, have you ever, I want you to listen up, uh, uh, senior citizens, and give ear, look at this, all inhabitants of the land. Not only the old men, but I want all of the southern kingdom to listen to what I have to say. He says, have this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers. That is, have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like this? I, I, I concur with Joel. I've never, never. seen anything never. like this. And I, when I say that this, it's not simply the coronavirus, for we've had uh, other viruses. We've had deadlier viruses. But the response to it, the response of the media, the response of the politicians, and the thing that's most disturbing is the response of many believers. I'm taken aback by the sheer number of believers who, when talking about this in private, do not talk scripture, do not say what God said. We, 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 let me tell you, this thing has got to be in your heart. And what proves whether or not it is truly in your heart. It's not good times. It's not when the money is rolling in. When everybody's inviting you to preach. When uh, uh, we have surpluses. It's not when they've called you to preach on this platform or that platform. I've heard many preachers uh, boast on the stages and the platform that they've been, been invited to and all of that. You notice this. When times get hard, all that stuff go away. No, the true test of the man or the, or the woman of God is what you have to say 
and how you respond when times are hard. Joel said, I've never seen anything like this. And he said to them, tell your children. And tell your children to tell their children. Tell the succeeding generations about this thing that's going on. He said, because we are facing something uh, unlike anything we faced before. What were they facing? They were facing something that is, that mirrors what's going on right now. Right now. I, I know that uh, if you pay attention to the media, you would think that the only thing that's, that is happening in the world is the coronavirus. You would think that the only thing that's killing people is the coronavirus. One of the ways that in some countries the count is so high is that a man can have heart disease, cancer, tuberculosis, a pneumonia, and the flu combined. But if he also contracts the coronavirus, then the cause of death is corona, not any of those other underlining causes. And so it, it, is, it is causing people to go into a frenzy and people are afraid and there's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of corona. But in Africa right now, right now, in East Africa right now, there is a plague of biblical proportions. Hundreds of billions of locusts in swarms the size of major cities are lying waste the crops in their path. It's the worst outbreak in 25 years in Ethiopia. In Kenya, make that the worst in seven decades, fueling the locust destruction. And could it be that perhaps one of the reasons the American media is not concerned about it is that right now it's in Ethiopia. It's in Kenya. But fueling the locust destruction is a bounty of vegetation f following unusually heavy rains. All that food means that the landscape can support a huge number of rapidly breeding insects. The problem is about the problem is about uh, to get much worse. The insect population could boom by a factor of 500 by June. And it's talking about how these, in, these locusts are larger than normal. Their swarms are larger than normal. And look, look at this. Um, uh, listen, I want to read this to you directly. It says, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN is calling the situation in the Horn of Africa extremely alarming and estimates that a swarm covering one square kilometer can eat as much food in a day as 35,000 humans. This is going on right now. Well, in Joel's day, there was a swarm of locusts. And I see what Joel said, that which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locusts have left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the uh, canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. The, let's look at this for a moment. Uh, that which the gnawing locust, palmer worm. And what it is, it's describing here, the same family of locusts in various stages of development. Yes, so it is the gnawing locusts. Yes, uh, you, they, they have a huge appetite. But what they have left, the swarming locusts that fly around, that they have eaten. And whatever the leftovers they uh, left, the swarming left, the young locusts, canker worm, half eaten. And what the young locusts left, the caterpillar, the destroying locusts, have eaten. 
It was unprecedented. Joel said, have you ever seen anything like this? A huge swarm of locusts that looked like a continent moving, moving, walking, breathing, consuming everything in its path. And guess what the preacher says? Notice what the preacher doesn't do. He doesn't at first pray that God uh, get rid of the locusts. The preacher goes straight to the problem. So this is why I say uh, preachers and uh, ministers and leaders stay connected to God. We speak for the Lord. It's not important that you understand me. It's important that you understand God. Hallelujah. Look at this. It says uh, in verse 5, uh, Joel says, wake, awake. Wake up, you drunkards. You see, the problem with society at the time, and see if that mirrors this society. The society of the southern kingdom, among other things, had become a sinful pleasure-seeking society. Notice how God has shut down all of the pleasures. Industries. NBA, out. NFL, uh, maybe out. Major League Baseball, shut down. Hollywood, the biggest concentration of wicked people and immoral people the world has ever known. They've had to stop production. Oh, you don't hear me today. It says here, awake ye drunkards. Told the drunkards, sober up and weep and howl, all ye drunkards of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. That is, you're going to sober up now. You're going to sober up now because there's no wine to drink. Some people looked at me funny last Sunday when I said to the AAU and these other uh, sports agencies that enjoy having kids out on the playground on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock and all this kind of stuff, during the church hour. God knows how to shut all that stuff down. He says, you're going to sober up now. Wake up, you drunkards, for a nation. Now, he's speaking here, for those of you who are strict Bible students, the nation that he's speaking of is the swarm of locusts which are a precursor to either the Assyrians or the Babylonians who would swarm uh, uh, the nation in the times to come. Most believe that the uh, locusts represented the coming Assyrians. So he calls the locusts here a nation. A nation has come up upon my land. Strong, look at this, and without numbers, whose teeth are as the teeth of lions, of, as, a, as a, a lion. And he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Describing how vividly how they can eat and consume uh, food. Look at this. He hath laid my vineyards waste. And look at this. Barked my fig trees. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. What is he saying here? The two principal crops of the southern kingdom were the vineyards and the fig trees. The these locusts consumed the vineyards. They ate the bark off the fig trees. And you know if they ate the bark off the fig trees, they ate the fig tree, the figs. The barks are gone. The vineyards are consumed. What are you saying, preacher? Their economy tanked. Yes, Three point some odd million filed for unemployment last week in America. I wonder how many filed in Judah when these locusts came. It shut down the economy. Praise the Lord. And oh, look at what's going on. And he told the drunks, you better wake up. And told the people, you better come to your senses because you become a pleasure-seeking, a sinful pleasure-seeking society. You know, the Bible said in the last days, men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And look at what is happening to our nation today. 
He says to the young women in verse 8, lament like a virgin, gird, look at this, gird with sackcloth for the husbands of, your, of her youth. That is, young ladies, take off those nice clothes. Put on sackcloth, which is uh, a mourning outfit, which is very abrasive to the skin. It will chafe the skin. It will cause rashes. It's what you put on to afflict yourself in mourning. And she's, he says, for the young women to go in mourning for the, their husband, that is, for the farmers. You need to pray for the vineyard keepers, for the farmers who have planted the figs because they have been put out of business. Yes, They've laid off thousands. They've laid off the country. People can't work because of this plague. What brought the plague? Sin. Sin. Brought the plague. The religion of the southern kingdom by now had been reduced to mere formality. It was formalism. It was people going through the motions. And they had gotten to the place under the reign of Uzziah where they had taken God and his prosperity for granted. They assumed that the way things are is the way things will always be. Sounds familiar? Oh, we just assume that America is going to always be blessed no matter what she does. No matter how many babies that she kills a day, no matter how she has a, a redefined marriage to include abominable behavior, no matter how we've had the White House decked out in wicked colors to, to represent wickedness and how preachers have invited politicians who are married to men, a man married to a man invited to a Christian church and served, given communion. God knows how. God knows how to shut the nation down. A nation where men are going in and having their body parts mutilated and then come out and call themselves women and women having their body parts mutilated and calling themselves men and then they expect the rest of us to go along with it. The growth of postmodernism, where we treat God as though he's one amongst many. We have more respect. Hollywood and the movie makers have more respect for the religion of our enemies than it has for the religion that made this country great. I say to you, God knows how. God knows how to get your attention. Well, preacher, are you saying that God made the coronavirus? No. Are you saying that God did it? No. But here's what I am saying. God, the God of the Bible is sovereign. Yes, he is. The God of the Bible is a God who rules over all nations. Yes, and regardless to what those nations or people's intentions may be, at the end of the day, God uses everything to ultimately fulfill his purpose. So you may, you may do it, you may do it to hurt someone else. But if God allows it, then at the end of the day, the Lord knows how to bring to pass what he wants brought to pass. Because let me tell you something, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, after he got up off of his knees, he, 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 he declared that the God of heaven rules in the affairs of men and he that is up to high that God is able to abase I'm glad to know that the God I serve is in charge he told the young virgins to weep pray for the farmers and then in verse 9 he said look at this look at this it must have been it must have been the North Carolina mayors it must have been our governors it must have been some of these folk praise the Lord who don't understand the significance of worshiping and gathering in God's house. It says the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests and the ministers mourn. Uh, the, that is, they shut down the house because the locusts were so great, there's no more, there's not even any food to give God a sacrifice. 
there's no food to offer on the altars. And uh, let me tell you, empty altars meant for the priests empty stomachs. Because when the people offered an offering on the altar, the priest got a portion of that offering. But when it got so bad that they shut down the altar, the priest began to suffer also. I've had many to contact me. Oh, how many churches don't have large surpluses. Most churches in the African American community don't have a huge endowment. We don't have members who can write a check for a million dollars. Don't have uh, all of the cushion and how this thing potentially has the potential to put churches out of business. I want to say to you, put your hand in God's hand because the Lord knows what he's doing. He said, look at this, he said, the field is laid waste. The land mourneth for the corn is wasted. The, the locusts got it. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. There's an economical collapse. And I heard him say, be ashamed, O ye farmers. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley. Because the harvest of the field is perished. He told the preachers, the, the farmers and the vine, the, the, the vineyard keepers, the vine dressers, you may as well go to crying. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate and the palm tree also. Look at this, the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered because the joy look at this because joy is withered away from the sons of men oh that was depression in the land people had that deer caught in the headlights look on their faces joy was gone the preacher said gird yourselves and lament ye priests howl ye ministers of the altar he said come lie all night in sackcloth ye ministers of my God for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Told the preachers, you need to pray. You need to lament. You need to cry out to God because of the effects of these locusts. And then I heard him say, sanctify. Sanctify ye a fast. Call, look at this. The governor won't let us do it. But he says, call a solemn assembly. Call the saints of God together. Gather gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land. Where do you gather them? Gather them online. Gather them on Facebook. Gather them on YouTube. No, gather them in the house of the Lord, your God, and cry unto the Lord. Ah, it's time. It's time to repent. It's time. If we can't get here, wherever you are, it's time to repent. Thank God for the church of God in Christ. Yesterday, we had a prayer call of the board of bishops throughout the church. And they asked me in the prayer call to be one of the prayer warriors. I was, I was honored to be asked, for there are so many greater prayer warriors than I, than me, on our great board. And they said, if I want, we want you to pray for our national leaders. I prayed for the leaders, but I started the prayer with a prayer of repentance. Because you see, some of us, are treating God like God is being heavy handed. Some of us are treating God like God is being draconian. Some of us 
are treating God like we don't deserve this. The truth is we beg for these things because we failed to obey God. But when you get right with God, the Lord will, he'll send revival. I feel my help coming here. When you get right with God, ah, the Lord will, he will touch you again. So, I started to say, lift your hands and say, yeah. Yeah. Woo. Good God Almighty. And I heard him in chapter two, verse one. I'm having to skip. He said, blow, blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. When you blow the trumpet, it was two things. It was a call to battle, and it was a warning against impending, impending danger. We need to blow the trumpet. We need to tell the people, trouble is here. Trouble is around the corner, but we also need to call ourselves to war. Get ready to fight the good fight of faith. Get ready to fight for the heart and soul of our nation. Get ready to fight for biblical, biblical truth. Get ready to fight the good fight of faith. I feel a fight in me. I'm not discouraged. I'm not afraid, but something is rising up on the inside. I heard the Lord say, lift up the standards in Zion. When the enemy come against us like a flood, hallelujah, God has a standard. God has power over the devil. Say it. He said the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard, a banner against him. I feel the spirit of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. In my clothes oh Lord when you go in the chapter 2 oh Lord you see in the 12th verse he says therefore oh Lord also saith the Lord turn ye even to me with all your heart America we got the turn turn to the Lord well, Lord, I know this kind of preaching is not popular. I know that this kind of preaching is called judgmental. With judgmental, I know all the names y'all call me. Judgmental, homophobic, narrow-minded, all of that. But I tell you one thing, if you get corona, you're going to be calling me, asking me to pray for you. Oh, Lord, what we need to do is to turn, turn back to God. Turn to him in a real way. Turn even to me. Look at what he said with all your heart. I'm not talking about turning as a strategy. I'm not talking about turning as a technique. But God is saying, you got to turn with your whole heart. It's got to be real. It's got to be a real turn with your whole heart. Not just going through the motions, but turning for real. He said, turn and go with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Too many of us are saying, I've done nothing wrong. We don't deserve this. That, that, that's not repentance. You got to be able to say, God, we cause a whole lot of this. God, we got careless. 
We got careless. We got arrogant. We got the big head. We put confidence in our paychecks, in our job security, in our portfolios. But God showed us I can take it down. I can wipe it out overnight. I don't care how much money you may think you have. I can empty your pocketbook with one swear, fell swoop. He said, and when you repent, he said, rip your, rend your heart and not your garment. Don't walk around. One of the ways that the Jews would show that they were repenting, they would rip their garment. God said, you've been ripping your garment, but not your heart. He said, don't worry about your garment. Just rip, rip your heart. Repent and look at what he said. Hallelujah. Verse 13, rend your heart and not your garment and turn to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great look at this and of great kindness and repented hallelujah him of the evil if you get right god will he'll turn it around hallelujah joel said who knows maybe he will turn and repent and leave a blessing behind him even a meat offering hallelujah he said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Tell everybody, get right with God and do it now. Get right with God. We'll show you how. Right down at the altar where Jesus shed his blood. Get right with God. Oh, get right. Oh, get right. Get right with God. America. Get right with God. Oh, oh, yeah. Glory to God. 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 We got to get right with him. He said, if you get right. And I like what he said. Blow the trumpet. Verse 16. And gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. So they won't let us gather right now. And I know some of you where where wouldn't you got to have some sense. I you know what? I'm just gonna stay a fool. I'm gonna I'm gonna obey the law, but I'm never. I want it on record. I I never succumb to that logic. Well, you're not a medical doctor. You you're not an expert in uh, uh, how these germ how these viruses work. I never claim to be, but but I, I'm not an epidemiologist. No, but you know what I am? I'm a preacher. And 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 God, when all when all those other professions are gone, everything is going down. But the word of God, Hallelujah. God said, God said, praise the Lord. Gather the people. Assemble. Can't, you can't take verse 16 out of the Bible. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. That's right, clean up. Sanctify. Assemble the elders. Look at this. Gather the children. And those that give suck. That, that suck the breast. Little, little bitty babies. Yes, sir. And, and, and I know you just got married, but let the bridegroom leave his chamber. I know y'all been you're newly married. I know what you're doing but God says come out of there. And uh, the bride let her leave her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep weep between the porch and the altar. Let the preachers cry, weep, weep before the Lord. Let them say to God with a 
sincere heart. Spare thy people. O Lord. And give not thine heritage to reproach. Don't let us, Lord, be brought to a disgrace. Hallelujah. Do you see that? That the heathen should not rule over them. God don't put us in a position where the godless, the secular, the politicians who don't know you, who don't understand spiritual things, and who don't even try. Oh, the heathens, heathen nations. China is our enemy. We have political pundits who would rather believe the Chinese Believe the Chinese. Well, now we have more coronavirus cases than China. China just closed all of her theaters again just now. So they've been lying from the start. See, we, 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 we trust heathens more than we would trust our own. Something's wrong with that. See, we, you, you can't hardly trust what you Hearing because people play politics so much that they're scared for anybody to get any credit because if someone gets some credit, they may get elected or reelected, and you can't have that no matter no matter what it costs us as a nation. Oh my, that the heathen should not rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people? Where is their God? Lord, don't let us go down so low that the heathens rule over us and they boast saying, where is thy God? If we repent, Joel says, then, I wrote in my Bible, Elama Chukwe, I write in mine, and not before then, then will the Lord be jealous of his land. And pity his people. See, when God's people cry out to God and turn to the Lord. See, some of us are doing it, but, but, but too many of us are taking secular approaches. We're using secular language. We, we put everything ahead of the spiritual. We put everything, the political, the, the, uh, the, 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 the medical, the entertainers, but you know, it, 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 they show that that some some athlete's mother or f a parent got sick, and you your heart goes out to anybody whose parent gets sick or they lose their parent, but it but it shouldn't be special because the the the, the child play for a professional league, like like that really mean it's really bad now, so when that regular person who works a regular nine, nine to five mama got sick, that's not newsworthy. But when the athlete's mama gets sick, that means, oh, it's bad. There's something wrong with that. When more and more of God's people are turning and yielding to secular solutions. The CDC, private industry, None of those people will come up with a cure until and unless the God of Joel who orchestrates everything according to his purposes allows it. And I'm praying that he allow it as soon as possible. But I do realize because I'm, it says right here pray God spare your people. But I do realize that when the cure comes, or the vaccine, or whatever you call it, we're going to celebrate and thank God for the medical and technical advances that we have. But I'm telling you right now, nobody better say to me when I thank God for the solution, well, what does God have to do with it? You might get punched in the mouth. Because it's not going to happen until and unless 
the God of the Bible allows it. And he's not going to allow it until we rend our heart and not our garment. Why did this have to happen? That's the wrong question. Why haven't it happened sooner? That's the question. Given our abandonment of the God of the Bible. He says, but when you repent, then will the Lord become jealous <laughs> over his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I, oh, look at God, look at God. Wilson, look at God. God says, I send you corn. God, where is it coming from? I send you. I send you corn and wine and oil and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. I'll stop this thing. Brother cameraman, brother cameraman, I, we, I know we told you to, to uh, do a shot, uh, uh, keep it tight on me. And you notice I preach standing right here. And, and I didn't have no neighbors today to ask people to shake their hand. But I want you to do a shot and let the people see the pews. See, see, this is not, this, God is going, when the time is right, going to fill it up. God will put the people back. God will, God will heal the land. Yes, he will. He'll, he'll take away the reproach. It's, it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace that we are in a situation where the church can't gather together. That, that, that is the solution in America. The solution is the saints not coming to pray. What's worse is that there are saints who see common sense. Well, well, I understand. It's common sense in it. But from a spiritual standpoint, I understand how the disease works. But from a spiritual standpoint, the spirit realm, I thought, we believe this, that what happens in the spirit controls what happens in the flesh. That's what I thought. When, when, when uh, he said, now I give you keys to the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Uh, actually translated in the Greek, you can bind on earth that which has already been bound in heaven. It has to happen in the heavenlies first. It has to happen in the heavenlies first. That's why the tabernacle and all these things was a type, a shadow of the heavenly realities. God Almighty, I'm getting ready to pray. Let me finish reading this. He says, and I will reprove, I will, excuse me, remove, verse 20 of chapter 2, far from you. The northern army, that is, the army of locusts, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward, his front rank will be toward the east sea, that is, the dead sea, and his hinder parts, his rear guard, toward the Mediterranean, the uttermost sea, the Mediterranean, and his stink shall come up, and his eel, look at this, his eel savor, his rotten smell shall come up because he hath done great things. That is, because these locusts have wrought a catastrophe in the land, God says, I'm going to destroy them. So therefore, since I'm going to do these things, here's the word of the Lord, my friends. God says, fear not. O land, be glad and rejoice. Wherever you are today, 
when this broadcast is over, I want you to, I want you to conclude it uh, by there in your home, wherever you're watching us from. Rejoice in the Lord. Let this message change your attitude, your disposition. Don't be afraid. Don't be filled with anxiety. Fear not. O land, be glad. For the Lord will do great things. Great things. Glory to God. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. Look at this. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. What's that I see, God says? I see a blade of grass coming back up. I look, God says, uh, out on all, in all the wilderness where everything has been consumed and eaten. God says, I see green. I see vegetation. I see life. I see life coming back. Glory to God. What a mighty God we serve. They do. Oh, and look at this. Uh, they do spring forth and bear their seed. And then the fig tree and the wine and the vine do yield their strength. They had been heretofore decimated. God says, but they're coming back. Be glad then. <laughs> That'll preach right there. Be glad then. What you upset about? Be glad then, ye children of Zion. And rejoice in the Lord your God, whom you had previously began to take for granted, and you forgot. That's how you got in this situation in the first place. But you repented to him. Now you can rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. Let me explain this. In addition to, first lady, the locust, that was also a drought. And God says, I want you to rejoice, for I, I gave you the autumn rain. And I gave it to you moderately, that is, according to as I saw fit. And he will cause to come down for you. The rain. The drought is ending. The autumn rain and the spring rain in the first month. That is, as it used to be. I interrupted the rain. I called a drought. I stopped the former and the latter. God says, because you repented, I'm restoring that too. The rain, uh, global warming, climate change. See, these people, they forget that God's in charge of everything. So every, everything's in the Bible. All you got to do is just read it. God's in charge of everything. Well, I, it hadn't rained. I wonder what's going on. God's in charge. Wonder what's the Lord doing up there. It could be we need to repent. Could be that he's getting our attention. He says, I'm going to restore. And, and as a result of restoring the rain and, and doing away with the caterpillars, he says, the floors shall be full of wheat. <laughs> they were previously empty. And the vats shall overflow, shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore notice everything that I've the blessings that I've read thus far have been national what he's going to do in the southern kingdom but God speaks nationally and then God speaks personally he says to each, each person I will restore to you the years that all the the yields, the, the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The young locusts, canker worm, and the destroying locusts, the caterpillar, and the gnawing locusts, 
the palmer worm. Look at this. One of the most significant passages in all of the book of Joel. God says, my great army, which I sent among you. The devil have sent this coronavirus. Did he? Did he? I don't know about that. He could have. But it could, could it be that after taking him for granted, the one thing he did send that didn't get our attention, he sent a robust economy. Did, did, nobody get, did, did nobody get right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. A rising tide lifts all boats. Everybody's got jobs. He let the Dow Jones go off the record. He's done all kinds of things. And yet we see more and more wickedness and people arguing for more and more wickedness. It's amazing what happens during times like these. You can't find them folks. You can't find them. Oh, they are in hiding, waiting for good times to come back so that they can go back to their sinful ways. Whether God's hand made Corona COVID-19 or not, I cannot say. Whether it came from that laboratory that's about four miles from Wuhan or from bats. I don't know. But I know this. The God of the Bible had a hand in it. Nothing happens except he allows it. Nothing happens. Nothing happens that will interfere or cancel his ultimate purpose. Regardless of to the intent of the doer, God is still in charge. And we learn here that these swarming locusts that destroy the economy, that shut down the house of God, that, that uh, made the people so poor that they didn't have an offering. We learn with all that devastation, in verse 25, the last clause, who was the culprit? God was behind it. But he did it because he loved them and wanted to bring them to repentance. Well, what worse can happen than, than this? What, wor what can be worse than uh, this coronavirus? You're dying and going to hell. I'm being lost forever. What's worse than the coronavirus? Churches, church services being reduced to mere formalism. You've seen it yourself on television when they show many of the congregations now. All the people do is come to church, uh, in many cases, and just have fun. The preacher has become basically an entertainer. The congregations are laid back, swayed back and laughing. And we're sailing on a beautiful little boat, having a ball, and there's a devastating waterfall around the bend. God got our attention. Verse 26 says, And you shall eat in plenty, <laughs> and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. I have just given you God's truth. I called my superintendent, Superintendent Wilbur Nichols this morning and I said to him, Nichols, aren't you glad that the theme that God gave you for 2020 is not a theme that you need to change now. 
His theme was holiness. Our theme was God's truth. Time tells you to whom God has spoken and to whom God has not. I want to say to you that the Bible is the answer. Study your word. Stay close to God. I want to pray today a prayer of repentance. I want to repent to the God of the Bible. Because my friends, he is not being heavy handed. Oh, it brings tears to your eyes to see the malls shut down. It does to mine. To go to some of the places that we frequent. And the businesses are closed. Favorite restaurants, and they're empty. Parking lots are empty. When I pulled up this morning, empty parking lots. Not because we've shut the church down. Not because these businesses have gone out of business. But because the powers that be believe that this is the best response. And that's not what I am. That's not my ultimate point. My point is, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive the sin and heal the land. Point I'm making is that we have taken the goodness of God for granted. He's not being heavy handed. He has a solution to this, but we've got to turn to him. For many of you, for too many of you who named the name of Christ, this Sunday was no different for you than last Sunday because you didn't attend church when you could have. Or the Sunday before last because you didn't attend. Because you took it for granted. Oh, I can get to church. Oh, I'll get there. Well, now you can't come. Let us repent. Let us talk to the Lord. And then God is going to hear us. And he's going to do what he told me that he would do. He said, Patrick, you tell them that I said that I will restore. Everything you've lost, God says, I'll give it back to you. I will make you whole. I will bring you to completion. I'll do it. I'll do it. Your job is idle right now. Glory to God. They've sent you home. That creates an uneasiness. People are now forced to stay home who, quite frankly, their relationships work better because they weren't home together as much. Now you got to learn how to do that. And you're not home in the best of circumstances. Because you're being forced to be at home. And, and for many of you, your money is shorted. Different things. Turn to the God of the Bible. Turn to Jesus. Turn to the one whom we have ignored. And watch him bless us real good. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. To say that you are good, you are God, you are holy, you are righteous, and you are merciful. You have been better to us than we deserve. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. You have been better to us than we will ever be to you. Father, we come and we repent before you. We ask your God to forgive us of our sin. Forgive our nation. Forgive our leaders. What leaders? Political leaders. Spiritual leaders. Leaders in every field. Business leaders. Leaders, oh God. Men who walk around. Men and women who live their lives as though there is no God. People who are under the illusion that they can do what they want when they want and how they want. Well, Lord, you're really showing us 
That, that, that's not the case. Father, we look to you. O oh, gracious God of the Bible. And we repent before you. We ask you to forgive us, Lord. Oh, God. For not loving you the way we should. And Lord, this covert 19, this virus that is spreading. Father, spare your people. Father, we ask that you heal the land. And God, do it like you did the former rain. Do it moderately. That is, as you see fit on your timetable. Because that's what you're going to do anyhow. And Father, we submit. We ask that you keep us healthy. We ask that you keep us safe. We pray for people's jobs. We pray for people's incomes. We pray for the health of our nation, the spiritual health, Lord, the physical health, the mental health, the economical health, all these things. Lord, we need you now as never before in the name of Jesus. Now we put it all in your hands. And for that person who is watching today and you don't know Jesus, I know you're there. I know you're looking. Don't turn us off. Don't turn us off. Don't scroll elsewhere yet. Wait a minute. Jesus loves you. You're one of the ones whose attention that the Lord is reaching out to get. Give your heart to the God of the Bible. It's a simple little prayer that you can pray with us. But if you pray it, pray this prayer, and you pray this prayer sincerely from your heart, the Lord will even in this situation hear and answer your prayer. And he will come into your heart, wherever you may be watching, wherever you may be, whether you're in a hotel room, at home, with your family, in your bedroom, wherever you may be. Whatever device you may be using, Jesus loves you. And he sees you. He died for you and rose again the third day for you. Now come on and pray with me. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I confess you as the Lord of my life. And Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and that God the Father raised you from the dead. That's right. Pray with me now. And right now, I accept you. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for coming into my heart for saving me from my sins. I accept you, Lord. In Jesus' name, my sins are forgiven and I am saved. Thank God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if you've just prayed that prayer with me, then if there's someone there with you in, in the home or in wherever you may be, let them know that you prayed that prayer. Let them know that you are a Christian. Tell them that you've been born again, that Jesus has come into your heart. And if there's no one, call us here at the upper room, Church of God in Christ. Call and leave a message. We'll get in touch with you. Area code 919-829-6160. Call us. Give us your name. We'll get in touch with you. We're putting information on the screen where you can contact the church. We love you, and God loves you. And right before we close, there are people who are saved, and, but you're sick. I'm here to say that God is a healer. He will heal your body. 
Father, we pray for the sick that are amongst us. We pray for those who are even standing now, proxy for someone else, that condition in your body. The Lord heal you right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, turn that condition. Turn that situation. Father, we ask you to do what medicine cannot do. And we ask you, oh God, to get in the medicine and let it work as it is designed. We pray against side effects. We ask you to make people whole today. In Jesus' holy name, thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the God of the Bible praises today. Mighty God, indeed. I pray that you've been blessed by today's broadcast of the Upper Room. Amen. We are operating under the uh, current uh, stay at home. And uh, for those who have been watching, I pray that the word of the Lord has blessed you. That's one other thing that I want you to do. Um, to help me uh, with regards to what we need to do um, in order to continue to operate the work of the Lord. I chuckled today because one of the saints texted me early this morning and they told me, uh, Pastor, I want you to know that the goal of uh, me and my husband was to be the first two to give our tithe and our offerings through Easy Tithe today. I appreciate that excitement. As a matter of fact, I, I, the Upper Room congregation is an incredible congregation. I got many texts and many communications when we did make the switch and close down the gathering and to move to this format. I had saints texting me saying, Pastor, we understand, and Bishop, we stand with you, but we're weeping and we're crying. And, you know, I thank God for people who love church so much that they uh, wept at the thought of not being able to, able to come. I would much rather, I, I'm much more thankful for that response than someone saying, well, you just got to have some sense. Come on now. You just, we should have been close to church. No, I'm glad that, that our members have an affection for the house of God. Hallelujah. And I'm grateful that the Lord has blessed us to pastor people who want to be among the first to support the work of the Lord. And that giant audience out there, many of you who've never been here, but we hear from you. And you've said that this church has blessed you and you've sent uh, an offering uh, to our ministry. Uh, we ask that you would do the same. There, there are several options for participating in the giving of the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. You can see them on the screen. You may download the Easy Tithe app from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store. You may visit our website, upperroomgospel.org, and select the Giving tab. Or thirdly, you may mail your gift to the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. P.O. Box 44, P.O. Box 447, Garner, North Carolina, 27529. That's our P.O. Box 447, Garner, North Carolina, 27529. You know, that is not our physical address, but we would rather for the uh, offerings to come to the post office box. And if you can, we pray that you not send cash uh, in the mail for your own security. Uh, but uh, we thank you for your mind and your willingness to support the house of the Lord, that the work of the Lord will continue. 
Now I can hardly wait for this coming Thursday night because we're going to be ministering the word of the Lord again and uh, uh, depending on whatever uh, the uh, powers that be say, we will adopt whatever format that is necessary, but we will deliver unto you God's truth. Thank you for watching the Upper Room Broadcast. May God's choice blessings be yours. Enjoy the rest of your day. And everybody out there, join me by saying, God first. Yeah. We're going out with keep a light in my window. Woo woo. Oh yeah. Good God on my. Eat the pain.